Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous and I do mean over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this gorgeous last Sunday of the summer of 2021 which I believe is Sunday September 19th 2021. It's always a fun challenge deciding on what to read for my Sunday Doomsday Sermon. So, again, I'm coloring a little bit out of the box, uh, out of the box today uh, here at Collapse Chronicles, where somehow, can't even remember how my attention was drawn to this book actually came out in 2014 under my radar which isn't exactly about uh, the collapse of global industrial civilization and the planet uh, although it dances around I just think it's a good read and I just I'm about halfway through the book uh, and this is from this fellow named Chris Wright in uh, W-R-I-G-H-T. I know that I've read other books by Chris, I just can't remember. So Chris uh, is basically, <clears throat> a, a kind of as I consider myself, he is a far, far lefty. All right, he's basically, he is a <clears throat> huge fan of Noam Chomsky. So if you essentially are in the Noam Chomsky, Chris Hedges, Caitlin Johnstone camp. This fellow is like a mixture of, if Chris Hedges had a better sense of humor, uh, I see some Morris Berman in the guy. So if you're not uh, <clears throat> familiar with the works of author uh, Chris Wright, Maybe this will get you over there. So anyway, this is his book from 2014 titled Finding Our Compass, Reflections on a World in Crisis. And I'm just going to read a, just a few selections from the, near the beginning of the book. So here is how Chris Wright describes Finding Our Compass, Reflections on a World in Crisis. <clears throat> There is a time when the operation of the machine, with a capital M, becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you cannot take part. You can't even passively take part. So said Mario Savio in 1964. So, so say millions of the disenfranchised now as the apparatus of elite institutions grinds on pushing society to the brink, protesters across the world are putting their bodies upon its gears and its wheels to open up space for freedom and creativity unconstrained by institutional structures. It is time we all follow their lead. In a series of freewheeling reflections and summaries of historical scholarship, this book reinterprets history and culture along anarchist lines <clears throat> from a rationalistic and Marxian point of view. It illuminates capitalism, economics, U.S. history, popular culture, gender relations, and human psychology, even the nature of the fascinating concepts of genius and greatness, its agenda is that of the 17th century levelers. Deflate the pomposities of elite authority and bring the world down to the level of democratic reason. In the process, one hopes we will find our way out of the crisis of the present and into a more just civilization in the future. So, uh, 
that is how he welcomes us into his book and I'm going to skip the uh, the lengthy preface here is how he winds up the preface uh, to finding our compass <clears throat> I have to confess to a rather pessimistic point of view I think we are all in for some horrific suffering and titanic upheavals. I just hope we make it through the conflagration and into a more peaceful world on the other side. So, uh, you know, Chris has a little bit of hopium uh, in here, which I'm not quite sure he believes in himself. So what he does, uh, what this is, if you are familiar with what Caitlin Johnstone does on Notes from the Edge of the Matrix, basically what, he, what, what this is is, a, is just a series of essays on uh, all of these various subjects, just him discoursing and ranting. And uh, he starts out with this essay titled, Valedictory. I'm not sure. I, I guess this is if he was the class valedictorian, this might be his uh, speech uh, to the class of, well, I guess 2014 in this case. <clears throat> All right. Valedictory. Our civilization is approaching the end. We are peering over the pr precipice and chaos boils below. The time has come to sum it all up, to take account of where we are and what we've done, and to pass judgment. We, the generations now living, have been lucky or unlucky enough to be present in his, as history nears its climax. We have an abundance of human experience to survey and draw conclusions from, conclusions to pass on to posterity as it surveys the even more breathtaking ruins we will leave. We want to go out with some dignity, with positive lessons to impart to our descendants so that they know not all of us were idiots. We have lived long enough to learn life's truths. We have suffered enough to be wise. Let's cast our glance from the future to the past <clears throat> and grasp the threads of human thought while there is still some link between what was and what is some memory of what is rapidly fading. <clears throat> Perhaps some future explorer will discover our buried treasure, our Dead Sea Scrolls, and read about lost worlds and be carried away <clears throat> by tales of our folly and adventure. In the meantime, a few glimmers of honesty and perspective may light up our world and reveal it to itself. <clears throat> so anyway, basically where the majority of this book goes is basically how we got ourselves into the mess we're in. He doesn't make so many predictions about the future, uh, about where this is all eventually going to end, other than obviously he is generally pessimistic, even though he offers some false hopium here. So anyway, guys, I'm just going to, so we're basically <clears throat> talking about how he got in, uh, in, in this, in this, uh, in this mess. Um, okay, we're going to read this. This is from his essay on the use and abuse of perspective for life. 
There are delights and dangers in adopting a broad perspective on oneself and one's society. Looking at the big picture can either electrify or paralyze one's will. The latter possibility, paralyzing one's will, is obvious. Given, for example, the big picture horrors of global warming and capitalist global pollution, oceanic garbage patches the size of continents, slums the size of cities, cities disintegrating into slums, and a planetary future incinerated in the vortex of capitalism are not things that quicken the will to live. Internecine violence running riot from Mexico to the Middle East, from Central Africa to Russia, as governments outdo each other in the art of cultivating murderous resentments, does not inspire confidence in one's ability to make meaningful change. Despair on a cosmic scale encompassing life from a low species already from low species already extinguished to high species threatened with extinction suffocates optimism of the will pessimism of the intellect alone remaining the added burden of such modern afflictions has done nothing to ease the ancient burdens philosophers and poets have bewailed since the Upanishads, whoever that is. Earth is a pale blue dot in the infinite expanse of desolate space. What matter our little earthly tribulations or triumphs? Someday, We'll all be gone. Earth itself will be gone. And it will be as though nothing ever was. Obviously, this man is also a big fan of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. Uh, <clears throat> no art, no music, none of the sound and fury of a Faustian but forgotten history all is vanity, you know, quoting Ecclesiastes, all is vanity. The flower of youth wilts, as poets have lamented for millennia, withering into a decayed old age, and finally, death. Pleasures are evanescent. Time consumes all like Saturn devouring his children. The transience of everything makes life seem meaningless, as does, in another way, the immensity of Earth, however microscopic even it is on the cosmic scale. The prodigious mass of humanity compared to which the individual is too puny to mention. People come and go like flies. The plaintive cry of Ecclesiastes, all is vanity, still resonates 2,000 years later. Yes. On the other hand, <laughs> this is where he attempts some hopium. On the other hand, the big picture need not be utterly demoralizing. To contemplate the grandeur of the universe can be a nearly religious experience, Kantian in its sublimity. This is quoting Kant. Two things fill the mind with ever-increasing wonder and awe. The more often and the more intensely we reflect on them. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me, close quote. 
one feels vanishing, vanishingly insignificant, but gloriously exalted at the same time, uplifted to dazzling infinity, as one glories in the ability to reflect on this black, unbounded cosmos. The relative immensity of Earth, likewise, and one's being a mere momentary individual above, among billions fills with wonder and awe. Even love for all our fellow creatures stranded inexplicably on this floating island in space. Time itself overalls, translucent as a pellicid mountain river, the life-engendering flow of time carries us along to experience the beauty of change. The broad human perspective illuminates hope and the reality of change. Uh, okay, but again, guys, I just uh, I would love... Uh, to stick with this one, but we're going uh, <clears throat> to move ahead uh, to what one am I going to pull through, pull from now? Uh, this is from his essay titled Götterdammerung. Götterdammer. I guess that's German for goddamn. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I see. I don't get a lot of this man's references. I have to admit, guys. So anyway, this is from the middle of his essay Götterdammerung. Uh, he starts off quoting Camus. Okay. He's talking about philosophy uh, in this essay. The verbose perverseness that passes for philosophy now signifies a perversion of the human spirit, a discursifying of it, a domesticating institutionalizing of it, perversely appropriate to a society that has repressively desubliminated all that is profound and creative in life. The late capitalist categorical imperative of our culture, I guess he means pretty much culture anywhere on the planet, <clears throat> the late capitalist categorical imperative of culture is to trivialize at all costs and for all profits to privatize, atomize, marketize, professionalize, impersonalize, and stupidize all in order to replicate and accumulate, to <clears throat> replicate and accumulation institutions and a new man Homo bureaucraticus, or ultimately Homo economicus. Certainly, philosophy of all things cannot flourish in such an environment, nor can anything else that demands to be free and unconstrained by institutional limits. The existentialist cry of the mid 20th century followed by the barbaric yawp of the 60s youth movement, preceded by the anti-capitalist vibrancy of labor movements in their heyday and earlier romantic culture for the modernity ambivalent elite and Saturnalian revelry for the untamed multitude has died. Or faded from cultural prominence, but its echo cannot die until humankind itself does, 
the cycle continues and we are about to see another of its revolutions. And we will see what that looks like. Uh, okay, here's a very short uh, essay, one paragraph titled Modernity versus Humanity. Herbert Gutmann's Work, Culture, and Society in Industrializing America from 1815 to 1919, published in 1973, reminds us of what a rich world we lost with the standardization and atomization of society. Such diversity and humanness artisanal craftsmanship and pride, freewheeling festivals of life outside the factory. Actually, already in the mid-19th century, the dehumanization was apparent, according to Mike Walsh in the 1840s, quoting Mike Walsh, whoever he is, quote, a gloomy, churlish, money-worshipping spirit had swept nearly all the poetry out of the poor man's sphere, said the editor, the editor politician. Ballad singing, street dancing, tumbling, public games, all are either prohibited or discountenanced so that the 4th of July and election sports alone remain. That was written in the 1840s. <clears throat> local and national, back to uh, Chris, local and national power structures pressing the masses into dull, rectangular shapes, the nascent nation state suppressing local variety, spontaneity being dangerous to centralized power. All right, shall we? I'm going, we're gonna have a couple more. Um, as a, this is a 350 uh, page book. Uh, okay, we're going to look at what he calls, uh, we we're going to look at modern institutions. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, from the good end of the spectrum, are modern institutions. Humans, it turns out, are capable not only of play, but also of dull and dead seriousness. We have the capacity to obey authority and to imbibe its individuality-denying, repressively collectivistic norms. We join institutions or are subject to them to the impersonal rules that dictate how we are to act and think, and without even noticing it, we participate in the near extirpation of our individuality. The self-effacing, amoral, mechanical mentality of the typical bureaucrat is the obvious example, uh, which, as Hannah Arendt observed in 1963, can lead straight into complicity in monstrous crimes. But more benign manifestations of this exist. Theodore Adorno already remarked in the 1940s that, quote, even the so-called intellectual prof professions are being deprived through their growing resemblance to business of all joy. Atomization is advancing not only between men, but within, within each individual, between the spheres of his life 
close quote back to Chris, in leisure time, one might still play and be creative, though mass-produced culture was sapping even leisurely pursuits of their authentically creative and spontaneous element. But in the context of the job, in the context of the job, the rote conformism of seriousness had crowded out freedom and self-expression. Ultimately, corporate capitalism itself, with its hideous architecture of concrete hierarchies to control society and amass profit, was and is responsible for such pernicious tendencies, for the bureaucratic collectivism that requires but a nudge to become total fascist totalitarianism and for the detaching of hapless functionaries from the consequences of their actions so that professionals and bureaucrats and all intellectuals can become little Eichmanns engineering distant horrors and for the kitchifying of culture that brings totalitarianism into the sphere of play and for the routinizing and vulgarizing of creativity that empties life of its meaning. The two principles are at opposite poles, creative play and capitalist institutional atomization. Yep, yep, uh, yeah, then he gets in uh, to talking a lot about the uh, Holocaust uh, and so uh, Good Lord, he goes on a full-page rant. We're going to end up with his uh, full-bore rant uh, looking at the Holocaust. Uh, uh, on the Holocaust, where do I, uh, where do I want to jump in with this? He is debating uh, whether or not the Holocaust was, in fact, thoroughly at odds with the great traditions of Western civilization. So I guess he's uh, looking at the great traditions of Western civilization uh, and deciding how this should play in to... Uh, to the Holocaust. All right, we're going to jump in right here to wind up today's sermon with this rant. <clears throat> More pertinent is the fact that for centuries the West, meaning Western, for centuries Western civilization is what he's talking about here, <clears throat> has been more committed to quite different values such as insatiable greed, plunder, and enslavement of foreign peoples, genocide of native populations, vicious exploitation of wage laborers, murderous hatred of the other, ever-increasing policing of society, an atomizing bureaucratic collectivism that dehumanizes everything it touches. None of this has been because Westerners are uniquely evil or have a different human nature from other peoples. It has been because a new kind of society arose structured around the institutional imperative to accumulate capital at whatever cost to the natural and human worlds. 
at the same time as horrific tendencies of racism and nationalism gradually developed under the influence of an internationally organized imperialistic capitalism, trends of depersonalization, regimentation, authoritarian control, and monitoring of populations, and manufacturing authority-friendly popular attitudes through propaganda grew more pronounced. <clears throat> the violent, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping through this, the violent and tumultuous conquest of society by profit-driven market relations, not humanizing but atomizing and instrumentalizing spread reifying habits of thought that reduced humans to numbers calculations, agglomerations, categories, ideologies, foreign objects to be used and discarded, ever larger concentrations of capital and industry made possible and necessary ever larger bureaucracies with their diabolical Weberian formal rationality and efficiency, exquisite subordination of every human impulse to the order from on high, the administrative rule, the technique for the smooth functioning of power. Corporate capital and national governments matured together intertwining in their policy formation and administrative machinery the interest of one often becoming the interest of the other, each requiring for the sake of its power that social dissent be regulated or eradicated and domestic capital continue accumulating. In an overcompetitive capitalist world, the obsession of big business with big profits led to nationalistic protectionism, tariff wars, conquest of colonial markets, the scramble for Africa, an international arms race that exalted blood and iron as supreme values and ideologies of national and racial grandeur to justify all of this imperialism. A brutalization of the human spirit proceeded apace particularly as savage colonial wars and amoral colonial administration trained bureaucrats in the efficient use of pure violence to attain the ends of power. Anyway, guys, I think you get the drift, and he goes on... Uh, for several hundred more pages. But anyway, I'm going to put the link on here because I just went on the link and the entire book, um, the entire book is available for free. So uh, if you were inspired by anything you just heard, uh, all you got to do is go on this link and I think it will take you into the rest of this book. But anyway, we're going to wrap it up here and say, uh, say amen to, uh, to Chris. Well, I cannot, uh, I've already forgotten the name of Chris's book. Finding Our Compass, Reflections on a World in Crisis by Chris Wright. And you can go on this link and uh, take it from here. But it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the collapse. And uh, I am being invaded by some noxious weed called Slippery Dock. So I have to go declare war on Slippery Dock.
while I still can, get out there and enjoy your last summer Sunday of 2021. Bye, guys. All right, little dog, you survived.